Bill, I grew up on the Front Range in the Denver area, uh, rural Westminster. Um, I brought a list here just in case I forget. <laughs> but uh, in the late 1950s, um, I was in an accordion marching band. And we did parades all over southern Colorado and, and Colorado. I'm southern Wyoming and Colorado. And in, including Steamboat Springs. So we had the parade here and um, we sold tickets to a concert on the Harbor Hotel lot. Some of you may remember that hotel. So anyway, I sold the most tickets and uh, they were happy about that. And I must have been a cute kid, you know, and I could sell stuff. So as time went on, um, in the, in the mid-60s, my dad was the electrical startup engineer at the Hayden Power Station. So I was here a little bit then. Um, and, and got to know the town, kind of, but I continued to live and grew up in Westminster then. Um, in the late, you know, in the early 70s, um, my brother in law and I decided to meet in Steamboat and we were going to hike the Zirkles. And uh, so I was coming from Fort Collins, I think, and he was coming from southern Wyoming. And we said we just meet in town, and we met right here. And eighth and yes. There it is. <laughs> yes. Uh, we met right here. Uh, and, and we parked right in front of the old collection house. And you know, there were some guys, some a bunch of people our age, you know, in the yard, there's a big garden. And we asked them if we could park the car there for a few days as well, while we went hiking, because we didn't need to have two cars up there. They should, sure, of course, wonderful. And so that we parked it. So that was my first association um, with um, the old collection house. Um, in those days, both of these buildings, houses, were not here. So it was just a big garden, and all of you are sitting in that garden right now. <laughs> and what I'm going to be reading um, in a bit here are two scenes. One, um, in the Harbor Hotel, which burnt down in the 1930s, and it's now the site of the Steamboat Library. The and then the other one takes place in the old collection house. So continuing on, let's see. Um, I surveyed my way through college doing mineral and land surveying and then finally construction surveying. That's how I ended up in Steamboat Springs. They were, um, they were building the Hayden or the Craig power station. And so I was uh, surveying there, you know, making sure bolts were straight for conveyors and um, and stuff like that, you know, the construction of the power plant. Um, so I was here and I bought a trailer. Uh, in Fish Creek Trailer Park, um, where it turned out that my lovely wife, my future <laughs> lovely wife, um, lived right across the street. So I guess you could say we were we were trailer park love. <laughs> <laughs> and um, as time went on, um, we we bought the Munson House in 1985, which is just on 9th and Pine, right over here, um, and had two two kids, Nathan and Madison. Um, both who were born and raised here in Steamboat. So we were pretty happy about that. Then, let's see, we sold our trailer. Um, I've spent 40 years um, in, the, in the Pioneer building um, as a commercial photographer. Before that, I worked for ACZ as a chemist, an analytical chemist um, that helped buy my house, you know, and things like that. And then I got into photography and uh, and did 40 years worth on that. Um, in 2009, um, we published Harriet Freiberger and I, uh, this book here. Um, it's, uh, it was a, a grant from the Colorado Historical Fund uh, with the library being our sponsor. And it was, uh, we had 2,000 books printed they sold out, and so we're in the third printing of this now, and it continues to sell very well. So we're happy about that. 
And um, Danny McKinney and I are starting a sequel to this book, which will be Then and Now, The History of the Yampa Valley. So we're in the application process of that right now, and we'll just see how that goes. And that brings us to Victims of Love. It's called A Diary by Victims of Love. Um, and that's plural. Um, banished in 1914 to Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Both of the, well I should say, this book was inspired by John Fielder. Um, when he did the book on Colorado, um, he went through and did all the photos of, of uh, William Henry Jackson, who went through Colorado um, in the 1880s and photographed everything. So it was mostly for the railroads, I believe, to, um, to, to really know what they had and where they could put railroads and whatnot. And one of those pictures was taken in Westminster, a uh, low boulevard at the top of the hill. Mind you, it's very rural. You know, the sandstone castle is still there, and an orchard is still there with the most amazing view of the, of the flat irons and boulder and, uh, and whatnot. You can see all the way up to Long's Peak. So um, I saw that in the book and goes, my gosh, I huffed and puffed up that hill so many times on my bicycle. You know, I'm going to do a book like that. Um, and so that was the inspiration on this one. And I talked to Harriet and she said, you bet. And we talked to uh, Chris Painter, at, uh, the director of the library, and she said, you bet, and away we went. So that was a great thing. <laughs> so uh, I think that takes care of that. So a diary by victims of love banished in 1914 to Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Both of my main characters are British um, immigrants. Um, Julius uh, is uh, banished to Steamboat Springs for a series of indiscretions with his mother's staff. And Karina um, is here for her help. Um, she has tuberculosis in, in those days, 1914, 1916. Um, there weren't antibiotics, so the way that you um, became or well was with good air and a healthy diet and so that's why she was here. They ended up having a very rocky uh, relationship love story um, and so where I'm going to read today is uh, in the second act um, was two scenes which are actually entries for Julius's diary. It's Julius' diary, but when he is gone, um, Karina gets the diary and she reads it. And so she makes her comments on their relationship. And of course, you know, Julius is writing about being in Steamboat and how groovy it is, as well as, you know, Karina. So most of it is, in fact, about her. So um, here we go. Wildflowers, war, and the telephone. July 14th, 1915. The summer was, the summer stayed warm and beautiful. The wildflowers that covered the fields and the banks of the Yampa River are in a, in a continuous riot of changing colors. The spring started with the march of the dog-tooth lilies, an army capturing the soil on the edge of the melting snowbanks. The warm weather uh, laid a solid yellow flowered carpet of arrow leaf balsam rug, followed by blue columbines and blue and white columbines. Then the hillsides transi transisted to the reds of the Indian paintbrush, and finally the purple, the purple lupin swayed in the afternoon breeze. I'm going to give a chair and sit down. Okay. Okay. Can you see? I can see. It. It'll be easier if I sit down. Okay. 
Okay. Then the hillsides transition to the red of the Indian paintbrush and finally the purple lupin swayed in the afternoon breeze. The second summer occurred far easier than the first. This scape grace is enjoying his banishment to the Rocky Mountains. England remains far away, and the war in Europe mundane, though palpable uh, with the weekly coverage by the newspapers. The Russians live in total retreat on the Eastern Front. The citizens want bread from the Tsar more than victory. They are hungry and vulnerable to a populist movement where the wretched are an easy target. The banquet honoring Congressman Edward Taylor at the Cabin Hotel with Lavish. As a keynote speaker, his theme was the war. It's best summed up by the quote, the man who kicks about a penny war tax on a telegram will have more to worry about if Congress goes in for a very great increase to the national defenses. I believe that is going to happen. Forty banqueters applauded loudly after he said Congress will speed up preparations, increase the Navy, and demand respect for the flag. They roared again when he continued with, all of Congress is in support of President Wilson, and it is the duty of every American citizen to do the same. I laid down the newspaper on our staff table close to the cabin kitchen and finished my coffee. I assume if Russia folds, the U.S. will pick up the hand. America will not sit and watch the Germans and Austrians take over Europe. The special relationship the Yanks have with the British will not allow it. The problem is the battleship, like the USS Colorado, became obsolete when it hit the water with a 12-mile range gun and 20 knots at full speed. Foreign vessels are at 24 knots and have cannons with 16 mile accuracy. I could hear Maggie on the telephone in the kitchen. One-sided conversations persist as the oddest things. The obsession women find with this new device remains puzzling. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to see the person with which one speaks is as old as our species experience. Perhaps in a hundred years, the telephone will allow two people to, see, to view each other while conversing. But still, the simplicity of the human touch to the complexity of our emotion stand as the touchstone of our social experience. Yes, it's very hot. Remember, I work with several stoves every day. A pause of silence, then she replied. Of course you have my sympathy. I can only imagine. Another pause. Angela, is it legal for you to be listening to this conversation on the phone? <laughs> she rolled her eyes. I know you're a Mountain State's telephone operator. She tapped her fingers on the wooden box phone, shifted her feet, and leaned against the wall. Yes, I agree. Try wetting a washcloth or a towel. The evaporating water will help keep you cool. Well, okay, so good night down then. Just, just wear that. That's not even close to voyeurism. I know you're big and miserable. Who's going to see you? Your worthless husband is in a while. Sorry, that just came out. I realized that she was talking with Karina and Angela. I got up and softly stepped to the doorway. Maggie shifted the telephone receiver from one ear to the other. She saw me, and then she stood on her tiptoes, placed the mouth, her mouth closely on the speaker, and spoke quietly. It'll be over soon. How come I have to work? Maggie glared at me and spoke again gently into the box on the wall. Be comfortable and not so modest. I gotta go. The box. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, of course. I'll call before I come. Bye. She hung up the receiver and turned to me and flat-footed said, Are you spying on me? <coughs> no, no, I work in this kitchen too. She is more than eight months 
despondent and suffering from the unnecessary piety that you both share. How could you two do that? You were in love. Her temper radiating from her green eyes soared. Unconsciously, she pulled the pin from the blazing red hair, had tumbled down to her shoulders, and sensing the impropriety, <coughs> she quickly folded back up to her crown and stuck the pin in and said, Well, she's married, you know. I guess the door swings both ways and remains half open. Often, you're both impossible. And she stormed into the walk-in cooler. My shift was over. I turned and walked to Madame Holy's for a beer. Nellie served a comment. May your enemy have no sons. I questioned her meaning, and she would not explain it. I trust her for an answer, and she gave me a mysterious reply. You will see, I have. As I typed this entry, I realized my problem on two counts. One is my self-imposed curse, the adventure of a woman's attention. And the second, poor judgment. I cannot walk away from the attention. I see it as more foolish every day. That written, I have no idea what I'll do about it. The next scene and entering the diary. Wrong place, right time. July 22nd, 1915. I decided to cross the river and walk through Steamboat. Lately, I've been going along the railroad tracks because I didn't want to think about Korea. But a little voice in my head said, walk through town, it's been a while. I shared the Second Street Bridge with a new bright red freight wagon. Mud covered the large black wheels halfway up to the spokes, and the smaller front wheels muddy nearly to the hubs. It seemed odd because it had not been raining that much. Frightened chickens stared at me from their crates, and as others flew and squawked, kicked over their fellow prisoners. Good morning, Julius, the freighter shouted over the feathered fury. Good morning, Mr. Haney. It's a lovely day in the neighborhood. Indeed it is, he said, waving his hand. The wagon thumped off the bridge, followed by a chorus of shrieks from the kitchen, from the chickens. I stopped in the middle of the bridge and gazed at the sun-tipped water waves as a flock of mallard ducks flew under the bridge with strong and rapid flight. It's going to be a great day, I thought. A crowd of horses, horses munched loudly on their morning oats near the bank. Several had glanced up with a snort of recognition, a swish of their tails, and then continued their breakfast with indifference. It was still early, with few people out and about. I reached 8th Street, and again, no one was visible in any direction. Only the birds chirped, only the chirps of birds broke the silence. Karina's front door stood closed, but the side door, the gateway to the long corridor of a vegetable garden facing Oak Street remained open. She had a knack with the gardening and the plants drooped heavily with ripening produce. She and the coming baby would have a plenty of healthy food for the winter. I thought, good for her. And then I heard the scream. I ran down the garden and up the porch stairs. The kettle was on the boil and whistling away. Karina laid on the edge of the dining table rug. Her legs sprawled on the wooden floor, her robe open, and her nightgown wet from the waist down. Julius, I think I'm having a baby. It seems weeks late. I fell, and I can't get up. It hurts so much, she moaned. Stay still. Where are your clean sheets? In the cabinet, in the hallway. Peculiar thoughts of why me? And what now swirled on my head? The situation profoundly different, but generally the same as new life in the barn. I found the sheets easily and stacked neatly. Fumbling, I dropped one on the ground. On the floor, I let it lie and grabbed two more fresh ones, a pillow and a washcloth. How are you close enough to hear me? 
pure trans, I said, while thinking, what a bizarre twist of fate. I poured the boiling water into two lar large bowls, added cold water to one, and washed my hands. I dropped my pocket knife and a pair of her scissors into the second. She squeezed my hand through another violent contraction. Sweat covered her forehead. I spread out the sheet and pillow next to her. She, shifted, she lifted her torso up slightly, and I slipped the robe and her not wet nightgown off of her. Then I helped her slide onto the sheet with her head on the pillow. Are you cold? Do you want a blanket? Julius, you are seeing me completely naked, she groaned. I smiled and covered her with the second sheet. You're going to be fine. Get comfortable and keep pushing. Have you ever delivered a baby before? No, just horses. <laughs> the cat paced the floor like an expectant dream. Where's your husband, JJ? I don't know, she replied. The big baby's head crowned. I grabbed the scissors from the still hot water and placed the lowest blade on the baby's head. Gently, I pushed the scissors into Corinna's vagina and snipped Sam. Push now! The baby's head slipped out and turned sideways. I wiped his face with a moist cloth. Its shoulders were visible and blood stained the sheets. We're almost there. Keep pushing. With a loud scream, she pushed again. I guided the shoulders out with my fingers and held him as he finished slipping out. It's a fine boy, I cried out. Oh, let me see him, she exclaimed. Same day as me, mate, but a different month. You have a sweet mom. I gazed at the little wonder, then pushed the top sheet aside and laid the crying boy on her breast. That was when JJ burst through the door with wild hair and wilder all out all night eyes and pistol drawn. He shouted, what's going on in here? It's a boy. You have a baby boy, I said. He stared at the blood and then at the baby. Uh, Julius will be friends for life, he croaked. My dubious promise? Perhaps we will, JJ. Perhaps we will. Go get Dr. Willard. JJ stumbled through the gardens. I wrapped the baby boy in the top sheet and covered them both with Karina's robe. Karina smiled at me, saying, we be friends for life, Julius. We will, I whispered, as I gently brushed her hair from her face. And so now, this is Karina's comment, and she makes them all through this novel. I felt the first contraction the previous evening. I told JJ, and the bastard went to the saloon. I spent the night hating him. Oddly, when I saw Julius walking in front of the house, my water broke. I could have called the hospital because all the details were planned, but instead, I gently arranged myself on the floor and cried for the love of my life. He was with me, we were confident, and the baby came quickly. I had no regrets. Karina and water. Oh So yeah, uh, two day readers. Um, and so that, that was something that uh, didn't happen until about the sixth draft when I realized how important it would be for, for Curly to be talking about um, this love affair. So that's what it happened. Do you want to help me with questions? Sure. I don't, do you want to show any of these? I've been cycling through the photos. If you, do you want to explain any of the photos? Certainly. Certainly. Oh, we'll yeah. do that and then we'll take questions. Um, the photos are from um, the museums, both the Museum of North Coast Colorado, the TRED, a uh, private collection. Um, and when I saw these... Can back up a little so Negative. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jane can't see. Back up a little so we can oh, all see. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Where can I go? Right. Where go? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the photos were so whimsical um, that... Uh, um, I knew I had to write a story to them, 
And so this is one of the scenes in the book, you know, called Desperate Ice Skating. Uh, Karina is pregnant and she's trying to, and she's quite good skater and she's crashing to the ice often as she can, hoping that, you know, we'll abort the baby or something, you know, so she won't have to go through this. So that's that photo. Um, I read the Steamboat Pilot every single week from 1914 to 1916. So obviously the events and the people um, really lived here and my fictional characters knew them and, and did these activities. Um, some of the display ads were just terrific. Now <laughs> uh, uh, this is one, you know, and this is my wife worked for the Steamboat Pilot for a career. So um, I, I was very lucky to be able to go into the morgue and, and look through some of these uh, first editions. Well, they weren't first, but they were from, you know, 1914 to 1916. Um, interestingly enough, the newspaper burnt to the ground in 1909. So that's where we started was 1909 because that's what they had in the morgue. Um, again, um, Fly fishing it was Julius's uh, therapy. Um, he, he was having this relationship, and he would just go away to think about it and fish. And also, you know, he was remorseful for, you know, his indiscretions and why he was banished. And um, he was really concerned about not having sex again until he was married. So, this is Karina and one of her friends fishing. And this is. Um, one of the chapters, you know, of the photos for him. Uh, Mr. Haney, um, he was driving a red wagon with the frightened chickens. Um, and this was one of his ads in the steamboat parlor. <laughs> Fish Creek Falls. Um, this, you know, is an iconic um, destination for anyone who visits steamboat. And so, you know, Julius was a, a volunteer um, they were fixing the road, and this actually happened, fixing the road to, to Fish Creek because it had become so rough. So they were there with picks and shovels and whatnot, you know, leveling it out so it would be a much smoother ride up to Fish Creek Falls. Um, in addition to that, uh, it was a good roads day, and it was advertised in the Steamboat Pilot that, please, everyone volunteer for this service. It's this weekend. And they did this, and they had lunch, and then the lunch was over by the bathhouse. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was very convenient minded. Um, uh, being up in you know Buffalo Pass area and uh, enjoying enjoying the water and the lakes. So it's just a nice job. Um, women's rights uh, are very big in this novel. Women. Although they could vote um, in Colorado and Wyoming too, um, uh, it wasn't a federal law that women could vote until 1920. And uh, so women kind of got a raw deal back in the 1914, 1916, this era. And so there, there were many, many restrictions of what they could do. Um, as an example, the women that lived in Brooklyn, um, where the spoons were and uh, houses of ill recruit, they could never cross the river to Steamboat with, without cat calls and perhaps being arrested. The other side of that coin is the women of Steamboat would never consider going to Brooklyn because if they were seen there, they'd lose their job or, you know, it would be uh, very, very shameful and very difficult for their lives. Um, the Mountain States Telephone. Uh, this is uh, from the tram here. This is their photo. Um, uh, fascinating. You know, the women who, who did that. They really, really were pushing to get the telephone system all through uh, from Denver to, you know, all the way up the Yampa Valley to Craig. You know, this was really a big deal. They were laying wire and there were ads and ads and ads, you know, in the steamboat pilots saying, phone's here, sign up. And so people were uh, very enthusiastic. Julius had trouble with the telephone. He, 
he had trouble embracing it. Uh, uh, but he did okay. Uh, another tried photo here. Um, towards the end of the book, there, there's an escape. Um, but, you know, Julius does try um, skiing, and he enjoys it, and I, I've always loved this image. So I, what was his name again? Rex Gill. Yeah, Rex Gill, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, love it. Um, this is a love it. Again, a uh, trade image, and um, Katie suggested this one. <laughs> I like it. Um, it's great, you know, because you know, you know the winter's going on and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and this is like uh, Angela, who um, was the supporting character. But she's not the state's telephone, too. Yeah. Do we know what make car that is? What kind of car is it? Like a Chevy Volt? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know either. It's a very colored car, but still, that's the best I can do. I, I don't know. I mean, it looks like a pickup to yeah. me, you know. Mm. It's probably I mean, the 20s because of her bob in that hat style. Right, right. Yeah. Um, this is the lobby of the Cabin Hotel. Um, sadly, um, it, it burned down in the 30s. Um, it was very, very uh, elegant. It, it had all of the events, important the congressmen coming to uh, give talks at the banquet. But Julius worked. Uh, uh, that's you know he worked in an estate um, with his parents. He was from the service class, and so he knew how to set a table since he was tall enough to look over it and. So it, became, it was very easy for him to get a job as a server and doing everything at the Cabin Hotel. Um, and so many, many scenes take place in the Cabin Hotel. Oh, we did that. Um, again, this is a tread photo. Um, and this is the cover of the Then and Now. Um, <laughs> um, we, and that's the back of the cover, the back cover of the Then and Now. And victims of all. Does anyone have any questions for Kent? Oh, or comments, Harriet? <laughs> Tell, talk about the hotel and where it was. And the hotel is at the present site of the Steamboat Library, almost exactly, right there at the bridge, and in the Yamba. Um, it was had steamed heat. Um, it had a bathroom on every floor. Um, it was really quite elegant. Um, and people who who worked here for the summer, as an example, uh, in Strawberry Park, you know, they were producing strawberries like crazy. And so, you know, like the managers and the people who ran that show would live at the hotel. So there was long-term. Um, lodging there obviously and people did that but in the short term too do we know when yeah. it was built right after the railroad came in 1909 and it burned in 39. yeah and two people died in the fire yes yeah, exactly yeah what caused the fire and there was nothing they could do about it there were so many buildings that burned yeah that. do you she wants to know how it what caused the fire something the, in the boiler room in, yeah, it was the chimney something yeah, yeah. Something January, it was like negative 40 <laughs> that day. It was a wood structure, so yeah. um, it spread quickly, and there was really nothing they could do about it. I mean, they just tried, they got all the people they could out there, two were still trapped. And I mean, you, have, you can see photographs of people standing around in nightgowns, you know. It was oh, like, yeah. It was just like, boom, you know. The museum has it, color it, footage of the fire happening breaking out <laughs> and people trying to get out and then you could see the like the progression of it and the change of the color of the smoke and the oh, yeah. um it's all on film if you want to watch it in the history of steamboat room <laughs> there was a picture earlier and i don't know if you can find it but it was a, i think it was a main street and there were a lot of people yeah what was that what was that what was the it? This picture, Ken, it says tug of war on skis. Yeah. This picture. This is Winter Carnival. Um, oh, we didn't go through these photos. This is Winter Carnival. This is a um, 
photograph from the Museum of North West Colorado. So Winter Carnival, obviously, it was the, the second Winter Carnival, but it was the first one that was up on Howison Hill, which in those days was called Elk Park. Um, and this, <laughs> this is an interesting story. The city bought that land, and this was around 1910, 1911, um, because the railroad went through there, and the city fathers were very concerned about people traveling along and seeing all the shanties that were there <laughs> uh, before they got to the depot. So they bought it, and everybody had to go. So it was the city. It was Sounds the city, familiar, doesn't yeah. it? So it was the city land, and that second when a carnival was up there, and Carl Hamilton, who was involved with the first one, made it happen. Yeah, they're like, we'll put elk on it as like a preserve. Yeah. And right. so they were just elk wandering around, and then they started skiing on it, but did not move the elk. So people are <laughs> just moving, skiing around the elk. So when did Carl Howlson come? He comes in uh, 14, 1914. Okay. Yeah. Oh my goodness. But it looks exciting. Forty have, below? We'll go backwards. We have come more I know. I, I see the couple. There you go. There's Howlson Hill. Yeah, this is, you know, um, actually on... Hamilton Hill, you know, that, this is that 1915 Winter Carnival, mm -hmm. February 1950. Do you think that's Carl? Yeah. I don't know who that no. is. No, that doesn't look like his body. No? <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you he, he looks, I spent a lot of time looking at he looks daring to silhouettes me. of ski jumper. Yeah. This is the cabin right there. Yeah. Yeah, oh yes. You can see it perfectly. They what change in jumping styles. Yes, you can date them based on where their arms are and how far their bottoms are. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So this is actually, um, there were photographs that I, I, I needed. Uh, and so they came from my photos. Um, I took this picture in the winter, Fish Creek Falls, I don't know, probably in the late 1970s. Um, I came here in 76, so that would be about right. And uh, so it was an, Fish Creek Falls was, like I say, a very important place for sea bus drivers. And it's all water, it's all water source. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? This is Jim Crawford. Ken, do you know Jim? <laughs> Are you planning to write any more historical novels? Any more novels? He's working on um, Maybe. <laughs> I certainly have ideas for a sequel for Victims of Love, you know, doing a historical fiction novel again. Um, we're going to do a sequel to this one first. You know, we decided that um, that's a good thing to do. Uh, this was very successful. And it, it really makes me happy that people are enjoying it so much. So we'll do this one first. So um, to answer the question, We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Karen, let's if he seemed incredibly poised about delivering a baby. <laughs> How is that, is he is that fiction? <laughs> <laughs> I saw him birth both of my children. Um, and um, I don't want to say it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was quick in both cases. So it was kind of like that. That was my experience, and you know, and, and seeing, you know, there was an episiotomy um, with Madison, my daughter, and so it just seemed right to do that. So, yeah. so, so, when, she, so, so when, when, when was Dr. Willett here? From when to when? When was Dr. Willett here? Do you know? Oh yes, yes. Um, it, it was, and it's in the book. He. Um, he purchased, which is the Old Town Pub now, that building. Um, it had been um, a hospital, but, it, but they were incompetent, I guess, and, and losing a ton of money, it became a pool hall, and then he bought it and made it into the hospital. So yes, in, in July of, of 1915, he was operating the hospital. Mm -hmm. 
and for the next 50 <coughs> long time you know and 55 years he did yeah he also welcomed all the doctors to use the facility which was key you know that you can have all of them together and working together and being able to communicate and and know what's going on as far as all the patients and specialties or whatever it turned out to be. Anything else? Well, so thank, thank you. Thank you. Your two oh, main yeah. characters that met in the trailer park. When did they get married? <laughs> when did you get married? When did we get married? <laughs> we got married. Um, July the oh. 10th. Oh, the, so the trailer uh, park people are you actually. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's not, it's not there, there, was, there was some question back and forth between okay. the two of us over the years on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What surprised you most? What did you, in learning, writing and learning the story, what surprised you most? What was surprising about learning and researching and writing the story? Me? Surprising, yeah, for you. Well, certainly it was enjoyable. Um, I think the most surprising thing was, you know, going through old photographs and, and seeing, you know, such a whimsical group of photos. Um, yeah. It sort of reminded me of, of Facebook type photos, but they were done 120 years ago. And so I, I was fascinated by that, you know, the whimsicalness of them, and I thought, well, I'm going to build a story around that. And I started reading the pilot and um, knew that it burned down in 1909. I thought, oh, well, we'll start with that. And I just read every single week from 1914 to 1916. And so that's the story. Um, my characters were living um, the events that happened. It was everything from good roads days to um, the parades to Winter Carnival, you know, all the things. So baseball, my gosh. Baseball was very, very popular in Steamboat Springs. Um, there were games with Craig, um, games with Hayden. And the Hayden, <laughs> the Hayden team was called the Prohibitionists. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Steamboat team was called the Strawberries. So they were the Berries. So um, there were two news newspapers in those days. There was a pilot, um, and then there was the Route County Sentinel. Now, um, it kind of reminded me of a Denver Post and the Rocky Mountain News. You know, the Rocky Mountain News has great sports, you know, really detailed, you know, play-by-play -play descriptions of the game. And that's what the, the Route County Sentinel did. Um, obviously, the Steamboat Pilot, when they wrote about the baseball games, they were very proud of the team, or the local nine. But, uh, you know, it was very interesting. So that was it. You know, just reading the papers and going, wow. You know, it, it's so much like it is today, except for it was 120 years ago. You know, people were saying the same things and thinking the same things. And um, it's just technology was different. Where were the games played? Where did they play baseball? What, where did they play? Mm -hmm. Oh, they played down there um, in, in Elk Park. Yeah. yeah well, the where they played today. Where the fields are now. Yeah. yeah. And they played, um, there were teams, Oak Creek, Pittsburgh, uh, Mount Harris, Hayden, Craig, and Steamboat. That was the lead. Hans Peak had a team. Hmm? And Hans Peak had a team. Did they? Okay. I didn't know that. No. That makes sense though. Mm -hmm. You know, any place that there was a mine or a timber mill or or whatever, you know, had men that were looking to, to play ball. Yes? What did you find out about the pandemic of uh, 1918? Oh, well, she's asking about the pandemic of 1918. Oh, I found out that it was much like the pandemic of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, my degree is in microbiology, so I kind of um, studied epidemiology and and viruses, you know, viruses are, it's not a living thing, it's a, it's a machine um, that attaches, reproduces, and, um, and the host generally gets very, very ill and 
Dodgers and or Dodgers. So um, it was really serious and there was no, I mean it's a virus, so there were no antibiotics. Um, and it, which was the same as in 2020 and in our three years. Um, it was a virus, so no antibiotics could, you know, cure it. So it was just being healthy. Yeah. I read somewhere recently in one of our papers, I think, that Oak Creek had gotten some sort of an award for being the, the only community that um, adhered to wearing their face masks back then. <laughs> Odd, oddly enough, I kind of heard that, I think. Yeah. Um, they weren't wearing masks, but um, when the first vaccines came out, it was very difficult to find a place to get them. And so I drove to Oak Creek twice to get my vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just simple and easy. It was, it was great. It was very simple. Yeah, some, somewhere recently, I mean, within the last... Uh, few months I read somewhere they were doing that Oak Creek had gotten some sort of a recognition ah. for being the only community that stayed safe by wearing face masks interesting probably because their uh, demographic was almost entirely young men who were employed at the mines and um, that's young people were the most affected in the flu epidemic of 1918. So maybe they were doing it for their own, also just population, probably. I don't know. Speaking about the epidemiology of it all, um, when I read that the 1918 pandemic was called Spanish flu, but that was a misnomer, um, because they traced it to um, a U.S. Army base in Kansas. And then 1917 is when all the troops from the United States went to Europe. And so all of a sudden there, you know, many, many people um, became sick. But, you know, it was a war and very, very poor living conditions at best. So many, many soldiers got sick. It spread like crazy. Um, and they call it the Spanish flu because Spain was neutral. And they call it the U.S. flu, they call it the German We don't want to blame anyone. Yeah, yeah. So it became the Spanish flu, but that's a misnomer. Huh. All we are. Yeah. Well, uh, anything else? If not, Ken and Harriet are here if you want to purchase a book and read more about Julius <laughs> and Corinna. Right. Uh, they're in the book. So uh, thank you for your time and your Thank you very much. Your work. Thank you.